Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, lunchtime session at World Press Freedom Day um, 2021. Um, this is a short session um, uh, of half an hour, um, but I'm really delighted to be able to um, uh, welcome uh, Adelaide Trujillo, who's going to be my respondent for this session as I launch a working paper, which is co-published by BBC Media Action and the Primed Initiative. The Primed Initiative is, 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 is called Protecting Independent Media for Effective Development, which is a large consortium of, of organizations working together to support independent media and find new pathways to sustainability um, uh, around the world. So um, I'm gonna talk for about 10, 15 minutes and then uh, about uh, this paper, which is called Is, is Independent Media a public good and is public subsidy to support it realistic and then Adelaida is going to talk specifically about the Colombia experience of how the government and civil society and others have been perceiving the role of public subsidy of media and broader communication processes in Colombia over the last few years. Um, this analysis of a role of public subsidy around the world, and most of its focus is on low and middle income countries, and the potential of public subsidy for those countries, um, is, it goes back some way. As some people know, I've been working on an idea of an international fund for public interest media um, for some time. Um, this is not specifically connected to that proposition. But it is one of the areas we looked at as part of the as one idea of a kind of potential exit strategy for an international fund to ensure that if you, one is going to send up a very large scale fund, it doesn't need to be around for a very long period of time. But more immediately, the theme of a session is is inspired by the theme of World Press Freedom Day itself, of this information of public good. And obviously that's been inspired by um, Professor Joe Stiglitz who, as well as saying that information is a public good and won a Nobel Prize for his work on, uh, on, 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 on this area, says that independent media as a public good needs public support. So that's what I'm going to look at and actually whether just how credible, how realistic public subsidy is at this particular moment in time. So this is a reality of a moment of Windhoek plus 30. If you look at Windhoek 1991, um, I wasn't at Windhoek 1991, but I remember it well. I'm old enough to, to have been around and get, got extraordinarily excited um, by the declaration from it. I'd already been working on media support issues for um, certainly half a decade by then, if not longer. Um, and it was both fueled by, but also really inspired the political liberalization of the media worldwide, but also the economic liberalization of the worldwide. Um, and a lot of that the freedom, media freedom, and the explosion and recapturing of media, of, of, of um, media from the public, uh, from governments to the public sphere, was really very much a profit-making, advertising-based model, it's both consistent with and guaranteed the foundation for journalism in the public interest. It ushered in a new societal infrastructure of creative, entrepreneurial, dynamic and professional news media underpinning both democracy and development. And it led to the assumption, I think by among, particularly within the development community into the democracy support communities, that the media were a self-financing system. Um, yes, they required support very often in terms of regulatory and legislative change, in terms of capacity building, in terms of content production, um, in terms of business mentoring and so on. But ultimately uh, what one was working for and could easily uh, and arguably be the, the kind of prospectus of working towards it was relatively easily achievable, was an editorially independent, financially sustainable model. And the whole movement also led to increasing loss of relevance um, uh, and decline and purpose of state media. And now we're in a very different space and place. Um, we, are, we are seeing the reassertion of government co-option and control. Uh, we're seeing the death of the independent media business model. 
I would argue that most media on a planet are arguably now owned and or funded, and that's not just directly funded, um, uh, but also through advertising or through proxies or third parties by governments. We're returning, we have returned already to uh, a situation for most of humanity. They are just as pre Wintook, most people are getting their information on the planet from governments um, or through social media. We have an issue of an infodemic and broader social media system where access to trusted information is both more important for society and for development of a democracy, but the capacity to provide that information is rapidly degrading. And there are really very few alternative sources of proven revenue for advertising um, with, and with kind of philanthropic sources available, which many people are turning to, are under huge pressure. That's one of the reasons why we're trying to create an international fund for public interest media. And of course, for the moment is that information is increasingly recognized as a public good. So what's the role of government funding and public subsidy at the moment? Well, the dominant model, overwhelmingly dominant model, is one of control and of co-option. Massive ownership still of state media, mostly around the world, but not just state media being controlled by the, by government, but commercial media also increasingly controlled either um, by those often close to government and those who benefit from government policy and who have editorial positions that are often very favorable to government. Government advertising um, uh, to favored media is widespread and has been particularly seen um, uh, during the pandemic and withdrawing government advertising from independent media is a favoured method of political intimidation and political control and co-option. We're seeing favourable tax or other measures for government media and punitive approaches to independent media. And of course we see the astonishing and appalling um, and increasing journalistic intimidation using government power. So that's a pretty grim picture and would suggest that the idea of looking at public subsidy as a route to sustainability in the future is looking pretty hopeless. But there is a flip side to this as well. And maybe this is a potentially emergent model of public interest um, uh, government support. Some of the most trusted and most widely accessed media in the world right now are publicly subsidized. I work for an organization, BBC Media Action, which is connected to the BBC, but it's not just the BBC. Um, European Broadcasting Association uh, highlights just the rocketing audiences and increased trust levels during the pandemic, during the infodemic, um, of audiences flocking to media they feel they can trust, and those are often publicly subsidized. And given the confusion and issues of disinformation and information chaos, there is arguably a strong and fresh relevance to uh, um, a, a public subsidy model, which appears to be working very well, at least in some settings, astonishingly well in some settings. Nor is commercial independence, as I said, any longer a guarantor of editorial independence. Um, so it's not clear that simply by um, uh, relying entirely on a commercial model at the moment, that editorial independence will be assured. And we're seeing a great deal of innovation um, among governments who are at least committed to supporting independent public interest media. And I don't have time to go into all those um, during this quite short session, but the paper looks at the advantages and disadvantages and examples of innovation across these five areas. The indirect government subsidy, that's for example, tax regimes, um, direct um, government subsidy generally is called direct government subsidy is generally through uh, intermediaries of, of kind of lots of new grant making um, systems being set up by different governments. Transactional government subsidy, um, of, in other words, supporting independent media by government advertising, which we've seen an explosion of not just for um, uh, the kind of political co-option reasons, which I just talked about before, but also genuinely for public health reasons and genuinely to support an independent pluralistic media um, during, at a time of the pandemic. So an explosion of government advertising to, to media, often across the political spectrum, at least in some countries, and I document those in the working paper. 
And when I talk about direct public subsidy, by which I mean publics actually paying for media, but under a governmental framework, and perhaps the best easiest to, to explain our, our example of that is the BBC licence fee, which is not actually funded by government, it is funded by the public. Um, the government sets the rate of a BBC licence fee, but the BBC licence fee is collected independent of government, which means the BBC has a mindset that it needs to reach everyone, all parts of the public. Um, it has a commitment to universality, and that's how its kind of work ethos and culture work, is not thinking about what the government wants, but what the public wants, because it's a public that's paying for it. And that, and that model is actually, for all the pressure it's under, has just been renewed. Um, and then I talk finally about a slightly different category, but nevertheless I think still falls into this, of international uh, subsidy, which is, I mean, subsidy from governments, but which can be perhaps best uh, uh, um, in, in, in donor countries uh, for media in low and middle income countries. But where I think there's a kind of emerging issue, but if the issue is of financial support and sustainability, then it's absolutely critical that the decisions on who gets funding and, is not, uh, and who does not get funding is taken by um, uh, an independent, legitimate, credible body. And that's significantly the idea of the International Fund for Public me uh, uh, Media, which is where the governance will be um, uh, not by donors, but by, um, by an in independent board significantly made up of experts drawn from, from relevant regions. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with um, a potential choice between seeing this as a kind of delusional thing to be talking about, um, of which I'm gonna go through some really quite powerful arguments to suggest that this is, it, it is delusional to be talking about it, but also to think that whether we can actually have a process of reimagination around this too, and start being, having a slightly more constructive debate about it. The arguments that this is delusional are pretty strong. Um, autocracies, autocratization is on the march, democracy is in retreat, and the path to autocracy lies through the media. So the idea that, me, that, uh, that, that VDEM argues that the kind of roadmap um, uh, for autocrats that now, um, the, the playbook that they use is really well established, and the first thing they pick off is an independent media. Um, um, and then civil society before going on to um, the more formal uh, uh, mechanisms of, of, of um, uh, uh, how, how to game elections and so on. So we live in an age of growing autocracy, not democracy. So in that sense, this is a pretty delusional thing to be thinking about. It is also becoming much more politically simple and viable. And it's actually a really good political return on investment to buy control of the media if you want to control power and if you want to abuse power. And I don't think much in, enough is being paid to just the behavior of how autocrats think. And mostly what they think is I need to get to the media first. We're seeing a collapse of business models, which creates fresh opportunities for autocratic control and pressure. So an independent media is not um, it's not starting from a confident place, it's starting from a defensive place. And even in non-autocratic countries, governments feel imperative to control narratives in an age of disinformation. So this isn't just about autocracies here. Um, many democracies are, are, are tempted to control media and indeed co-op media where they can, given the, the, the broader, this broader chaotic information and communication environment. But there might also be an opportunity for reimagination. Not all countries are autocratizing, and some are newly democratizing. Um, the trend is towards autocracy, as Videm says, but there's many countries like Sudan and Ghana, uh, Tunisia and others, who are, are, are actually newly democratizing. Um, the pandemic and the infodemic, I think he is reassessing at least those who aren't full autocracies to really look at actually this, the, the quality and um, character of our information and communication spaces is really important in the context of democracy and development. Um, and um, 
that this isn't just about the societal costs of having of, of having a, a weakened media system incapable of generating public trustworthy information. It's also about some of the long term potentially political costs of of not dealing with those issues. And that's not going to go away. Climate change, corruption, other issues all require this access to trustworthy information. So for anyone, any policymaker who's got some kind of commitment to their society and some kind of commitment to democracy, these are, are becoming and certainly more likely to become really increasingly important issues of public policy to get right. Um, there's little sign that the current challenges and of mis and disinformation, there's a huge amount of work being done on them, but their consequences are, are not being properly addressed. Um, and whatever strategy is required to, to tackle misinformation and disinformation, any strategy has to be, has to um, include the generation of trustworthy information. And I think there's another element here is that I think there's a kind of assumption that this can, public subsidy can only work in mature Western democracies. And I think that's increasingly a patronizing thing to be thinking about. Some of the clearest democratic backslider are actually in so-called what were um, Western democracies. And some of the democratic pioneers now are in the global south. And so why should this area be considered to be the preserve of the BBC or the UK uh, um, or, or Europe or, or, or whatever? Um, I think that's um, a, an increasingly patronizing view to be taking. So what's the conclusion of all this? Well, we'll be examining this through the Prime Programme and, and more broadly with our partners over the next uh, two or three years. But it's clear, I think, already that this will only work in countries clearly committed to democracy um, and whatever approaches that um, will be taken will be highly context specific. Um, but there are an increasing range of models of public subsidy for policymakers to choose from. It's not just about, for example, transforming state broadcasters to public service broadcasters. Um, um, there's multiple other models to be looking at in this context. Um, and nor should it be seen simply as meeting market failure. It's also about a potential route to market creation. And this is partly this paper is a call for much more creative analysis and research um, uh, um, from, um, uh, from the international community, uh, particularly including academic community on this, because there's a huge amount of analysis and research on, 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 on market solutions, not so much on public subsidy solutions. And the scale of a crisis really does require creative thinking. Um, and it's not, and, it, and it's vital as this whole conference will talk about for democracy, for development, and for self-determination. But as John Kafour has been saying, um, and this is what, from a forward to the International Fund for Public Interest Media Feasibility Study, this isn't, this is about democracy, but it's also about self-determination. The free media is not only the bedrock of a functioning democracy and a free society, it is also an essential pillar of an aspiring nation and an ambitious continent. Um, he's a patron of the Africa Public Interest Media Initiative. So I'm going to hand over to Adelaida now, um, who I think might also talk about that Thing about about that, that kind of element too about how this falls within um, how countries regard themselves and how the public debate and, and uh, the public sphere is vital for um, reshaping and taking the country forward. Adelaide, over to you. Um, thank you, James. Good morning from Colombia. I'm actually in the coffee region. Um, Hiding away from this pandemic, sadly, Colombia today the fifth, the fifth country in the world with, with the largest amount of deaths. So this is a very important discussion. Thank you for inviting us. Um, just to mention on your paper, which I really enjoyed and I know the report quite well. Uh, I think what the, the the reason that I'm very happy to be here is that you mentioned our case in Colombia and the Medellin case particularly, and I think what's important about the model that was installed since 1991 and even earlier discussions in Colombia is still quite solid despite public criticism. So um, what we have is actually, and you pointed to that public subsidy, I think one needs to point out the distinction between government and state, state with a capital S, which is independent of government. I think one of the things that we learned from Colombia was that the constitution created, a, facilitated a right it was, it's rights-based and it allowed 
not only community media, community journalism, regional television, and everything associated with regional voice and national public media to, to have funding to guarantee independence and to give, give voice, establish dialogue. And built on that, there's a public system uh, <clears throat> established, which includes more than 11 channels at the regional level and the national public, uh, national public uh, mm, broadcasting channel. But along that, a strong, thriving journalistic, let's say, uh, body of professionals. Um, and simultaneously community media, especially journalism. So that uh, constitutional right is what we build on. Despite Colombia being a very, I would say, schizophrenic country, because we have a very solid democracy in terms of legislation and um, rights-based, uh, um, yes, legislation and, and, and structure, but we do have sadly because of drugs traffic and uh, political violence, which is associated with drugs and narco traffic, as, as you know, this is our karma. This, this actually weakens, particularly at the local level, at the regional level, the practice of journalism. I would say that journalism is the most affected um, uh, sector in the media. I, I say in media as a general, you know, public media, children's TV, public TV, educational TV, cultural TV, so we have that kind of a schizophrenia. Um, but I think the, 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 the lessons learned from Colombia, I think, should be looked at. This, the fact that there is funding that is guaranteed by taxes, that is guaranteed by the payment of a cinema tax, the fact that there's allocation from the National uh, Finance Ministry to guarantee the, the solid base for 11 regional uh, channels. Um, specific discretional funding from the state, from the provinces that need to be guaranteed. The three key ministries, education ministry, culture ministry, ICTs today, ministry, and uh, today the, let's say, the entrepreneurship uh, youth ministry, which has to provide funding. That's a, a constitutional right. And then the allowing uh, communities to have their own licenses, which in other countries in the region is not allowed. So that kind of foundation is critical. Case of Medellin, for example, that you mentioned in your paper, is really interesting to look at because despite the fact that there was humongous violence in the 1990s with the Pablo Escobar uh, Medellin cartel, there was a, a, a strong position against the press, um, against the drugs by the press, you know, El Espectador, um, UNESCO has a, a world uh, um, well-known award, the Guillermo Cano Award, and these uh, El Espectador and the, and the journalists fought against the drugs, and that strengthened that sense of, um, th those were the connecting points that then led in Medellin to the strengthening of regional public channels, which also innovated in the late 2000s in journalism. So there's foundations that need to be looked at. And I think you, you've also touched upon another thing, which I think is the research around this media uh, environment. I think, um, I think in Colombia and in Latin America, we still need to look at models that were built, that have been there for, a, for, for quite a long time, more than 30 years, that today guarantee some sort of, um, I would say, buffer against anti-democratic movements. And, um, and I think that has to be researched on more thoroughly. I think there's still a lot of body of knowledge to be tapped upon in Spanish, sadly. So we also need to think about, you know, South, South, North, South, translation of that knowledge for that uh, kind of request you're making in your paper. You know, let's look at other uh, countries and, and cultures and how they've dealt with this. I think that's something that we could, you know, definitely look at and support you. So um, I'm not sure whether you want to, to, to ask. And I, yeah, sorry. So, I mean, we've got a, a few questions in the chat and a, a lot of it is about kind of the issue of government control um, and the inevitability of, of government interference. Um, so can you talk a bit more about kind of, this policy in Colombia has gone back, as you say, goes way back to the 1991 constitution. 
so it's got a lot of history now a lot of experience um um uh in fact that's kind of the same time as 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 the original Vintook. so how has the media managed to well has it I and mean, what's the kind of debate on media independence at the moment and is is within the media the concern that the government's still using its money to effectively intimidate and control or, or influence or you know is there a sense for that is some of that is genuinely there to support public debate and, and genuine independent journalism well i think one has to kind of distinguish the, the journalism the sector of journalists which is very independent in colombia and there is huge debate around this government which is like a uh, a Brexit equivalent, you know, this is anti plebiscite anti peace implementation. Colombia has today the, one of the most complex and interesting uh, transitional justice systems as a result of the peace accord, which coincided exactly in 2016 with Brexit and with the Trump election. So we've been kind of suffering the, the same process, you know, the Trump era, the Brexit era, and the post peace accord in Colombia. So, in that context, journalists journalists in general except for those friendly with this new government which is now into its third year last year thankfully uh, are very critical of the role of this government against the peace process so you do see some influence of this government this present government with certain media and they have undermined independent media which are which have been a very critical voice so we we are seeing a very disturbing set of situations not it's not specifically government media into it's very subtle it's very kind of through the partnerships of commercial financial um uh monopolies and that are buying over very big uh very free independent media they just bought one they're, they're, so that's a very very worrying sign despite that you know you mentioned the the role of um for example the the soros group or um, different uh, donors has guaranteed that there's independence in many of the, the biggest newspapers like El Espectador. And we can look at that um, in more detail in, in your paper afterwards. But um, yes, there is that debate. I think it is a very subtle uh, uh, intervention. We still have a very democratic uh, public system. So, and there's strong reactions to any kind of interference because they're independent of government. And I think guaranteeing the independence of government and creating these, these bodies is, is one of the key issues. But yes, we know we're, we're going through that same this, you know, problem. And despite that in the pandemic, I have to say though, that this public system, I have to you know, also be positive, this, this education crisis that UNESCO has led on also very much in terms of public TV and public service television, providing support for education, we have seen a huge amount of support for the old media, radio and TV, which has very good content, which was created with very good grants that have, um, um, you know, guaranteed quite good quality in terms of, of um, reacting to the pandemic and, and the schooling. But, you know, but we are in a complex situation and, and Colombia is one of the most dangerous countries to practice journalism today. And, and we're suffering a lot of um, backlash with a peace accord and journalists at the regional level and at the community level are one of the key targets. But it's not government, it's illegal actors. It's drugs, it's dissidents and far right. Adelaida, thanks so much. I think we're pretty well out of time. It's been an extremely swift session. I hope some um, uh, people uh, got something out of it. It's actually wonderful to see you. Um, in, in, in the jungle in Colombia is um, <laughs> is fantastic. Um, um, I did want to just finish by um, thanking um, those of the, um, uh, the and to kind of saying a, a word about the primed program. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, as I say, a consortium, and you can see the logos on the screen, um, and um, uh, supported by the Foreign and Commonwealth. Um, and development office of, uh, of, of the UK. It's a, it's a big ambitious partnership to really bring together very diverse st skill sets from different uh, organizations. This is a working paper. It will form the basis of further work on this theme, but there's many other themes that will also, the, the, the prime program will be looking at um, uh, commercial, public, nonprofit, um, uh, um, regulatory and others. 
So please do um, uh, follow us um, uh, um, uh, at, at the links provided. And but a big thank you um, to UNESCO for enabling us to do this. And a huge thank you to Adelaida for, um, for, taking, for your fantastic comments and, and for taking part. And we will uh, stop there. Um, a, a very big thank you to everyone for, uh, for, for, uh, for listening. Thank you, James.